next speaker is uh, Roman Wachaletsko uh, from Abitibi so Geophysics, and his talk is entitled Borehole Gravity Over the Lawler Deposit. Uh, Roman is a BSc graduate from the University of Alberta. He worked worldwide with Geoteryx, which is now CGG Airborne, on, uh, on ground and airborne mining exploration projects. He joined Abitibi Geophysics in 2009 to work on strategic business development projects that led to the development of the ARMIT time domain system and commercialization of the gravity log technology. Thank you very much for um, having me here today. I'm going to talk about um, gravity log system, which is the borehole uh, gravity system developed by Syntrix. Uh, basically, I'm going to, it's a new method. People are not totally familiar with it, so I'm going to uh, go over uh, borehole gravity, how it works, uh, what to expect in terms of anomalies, and uh, talk about the data acquisition uh, part, how we did it. On the Lalor survey, um, Abitibi uh, did the data acquisition and uh, data reduction and delivered the data to the geological survey. And Ernst Stetzlar is going to talk more about the interpretation as they did the integration with the geology. The borehole gravity um, is primarily designed to do two very important things that gravity yields us, and that's uh, a detection of excess mass, uh, which helps us to quantify tonnage, uh, differentiate between metallic and non-metallic um, conductors, and uh, obviously it's a real good complement to uh, uh, borehole EM and EM surveys. Uh, the other important uh, thing that comes out of gravity is density. And we, uh, we can estimate a uh, an average density uh, along the borehole. And all of these things, if you combine and use them uh, early in the exploration cycle, uh, we hope will uh, reduce your cost of exploration. The gravity is um, uh, in, in the borehole system is uh, the same technology as in the CG5 surface meters. We've got a one uh, microdial uh, resolution and probably five to 10 microdial uh, noise envelope in the borehole. Um, the biggest limitation of gravity, uh, surface or borehole, is the signal attenuation. And uh, by getting the uh, gravity sensor down a hole, we can get it closer to the target that you have. So uh, we, we hopefully are uh, away from some of the surface noise and uh, able to get cleaner readings about the target. Uh, the sensor is uh, in a, a thermal chamber right there, which is mounted in a gimbal, and uh, that allows it to be leveled in holes that are inclined uh, from uh, minus 30 degrees to vertical. And this is a typical uh, anomaly. What we have here as, I can't quite see that pointer. <laughs> that's one. okay, I've got, I've got one here. Yeah, this, this is, I picked this up in Hong Kong, it's totally illegal. It's very powerful. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <geez. laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> wow. <laughs> When, uh, Don't point at anybody. <laughs> when the uh, sensor is above a, a, t a target, above a heavy mass, uh, the attraction of that mass combined with the Earth's gravitational field is positive. And when you subtract the Earth's gravitational field through corrections, you have a positive residual anomaly. Below the uh, mineralization, uh, you subtract the uh, 
uh, Earth's gravitational field, and you're left with a negative anomaly. The pool of the uh, mineralization on the spring in the sensor is upwards. So needless to say, as you go from the positive to the negative, you have a crossover. So that's the residual zero there. Uh, the residual anomaly is a crossover. This is um, what the model of the ore body looked like. Uh, the top half is more disseminated. Uh, the bottom half is massive to semi-massive and has a higher specific gravity. And what you get out of that profile, how that matches up with, with what we had, was a tonnage estimate. And remember, this is a tonnage estimate from a single hole survey uh, calculated by uh, Dr. Siegel to be about 5.7 million tons. That's in the right ballpark for a valet as they estimated that this was somewhere between 9 and 10 million tons. The density in profile that was uh, done by an inversion program <clears throat> shows an increasing density. In other words, the disseminated part is providing a lower uh, density than the massive lower part there. So that's the sort of typical, classical uh, borehole gravity response. The density um, calculations are uh, <coughs> fairly straightforward. Uh, you take uh, readings at um, two intervals. Uh, and the important thing is that the volume of material that is going into that density calculation is roughly five times the station interval uh, between successive readings in the, in the borehole. And the important thing is that there are no radioactive sources required to um, collect density. It is a calculation from the gravity uh, measurements. Um, as I mentioned, it's obtained by doing discrete gravity readings, taking the distance between them and the difference between them corrected, and you have a fairly straightforward formula that is used all the time everywhere. So there's no, no calibration on that. This is an example of what a survey for uh, density looks like. Uh, this was done for uh, Labrador iron mines on their James deposit. And uh, the green line is from the borehole log. The geologist uh, en encountered the hematite layer at 498. And that pretty much is where the peak of the gravity uh, anomaly is. And there's the minimum of the crossover, uh, which ties in very closely. Obviously, we do not have meter resolution in our uh, estimates, but this was very good for them. The reason they were doing um, uh, the gravity survey for density is there was considerable alteration on part of the ore body, and they could not get core for density uh, determinations. So that is uh, one of the reasons why you would really want to do gravity to get density. <clears throat> the field procedure, always start with uh, dummy to hole. Um, and uh, like any other gravity survey, you uh, lower the meter to where it's going and you let it settle for a while. And uh, once you start taking your readings, you're always raising it upwards, so you have a constant tension on the cable. And uh, you monitor uh, the quality of the reading in real time and uh, take repeat readings uh, several times automatically with, with this system and move on to the next thing. When, like any gravity survey, you need to close loops uh, to get repeatabilities. In this case, what we do is lower the uh, sensor to the bottom of the hole, uh, let it settle for a short time, and then repeat usually between 30 and 50 percent of the readings. Each hole is an independent survey and uh, you tie each hole in 
to either your surface survey or to a grid, but you need to tie all the holes together so you could use the data in an inversion. And in, in the Lalor survey, we tied them to um, uh, the CGN uh, database. Uh, there's the CG5 at the borehole. There's the borehole uh, probe, and uh, that's just a typical procedure. The Lalor survey was um, uh, sponsored by uh, or commissioned by the Geological Survey of Canada TGI4 program. I, I think that uh, was wishful thinking on my part that <laughs> there will be a five. <laughs> so. Uh, Sorry about that, guys. Um, <clears throat> we uh, surveyed five uh, NQ holes, a uh, total of about 7,000 meters. There were 155 stations that were identified, and with the repeats, we took 216 readings. Uh, this was achieved in uh, two weeks. And um, if you can read that at the back, you notice the crew arrived on January 31st. And the first reading was on the 1st of February at 1.31 a.m. That's not a typo. That's real. Um, the first day, they dummied the hole, lowered the meter, and uh, started surveying at uh, 1.30 in the morning. It's a 24-hour operation because uh, when you have a $300,000 probe, you do not leave it in the hole unattended. So if someone is going to be there attending it, they might as well be reading it. The data that's recorded is uh, obviously your depth, your uh, gravity readings, uh, and uh, a whole bunch of monitoring data. Borehole gravity data processing is uh, uh, pretty standard uh, information, and uh, we uh, obviously do the title. The, the linear uh, uh, corrections are determined from those repeat readings through a least squares fit analysis. And uh, on the LALAR survey, there were no outliers. There was no data that was rejected, no readings that were rejected. <clears throat> this is typically what we would deliver with uh, formulae for you to get from each step to step. And on the LALAR survey, um, we surveyed these five holes. Um, give you an idea of the spread between the holes um, was uh, you know over a thousand meters uh, in the north-south direction and 750 meters in the east-west direction. The, the holes are around the deposit because all the holes that intersected the deposit were already cemented uh, in uh, January so we could not get any holes uh, surveyed that were any closer than this, I presume. At any rate, um, Ernst might, might talk about why these holes were selected. So if you recall the scale, uh, 279 was the hole on the, on the south up dip side, and uh, the other holes are on the, on the north edge. There's a tremendous distance between these, um, uh, these holes, and the deposit is straddled between them. I'm going to provide you with uh, data, a uh, closer look at the data on hole 279 and 282. The reading interval, um, uh, basically, uh, I think right there, generally in the upper part of the hole in the, in the uh, hanging wall was about 100 meters and uh, about 20 meters in the foot wall and around the mineralization. That's sort of a guide. Uh, there, were, there were some differences in there. <clears throat> this is a typical product that we um, deliver. And uh, this is hole 282. Uh, two uh, crossover anomalies. Uh, there's, uh, there's the first. And uh, the second, and they both are uh, in uh, coincident with, uh, with uh, mafic um, rocks. Uh, and again, although they're mafic rocks, they are of a different density. 
So um, the gravity is certainly responding to any density changes in lithology along the way. And at the bottom, there appears to be some uh, mafic intrusives and, and things, but uh, that, that's the type of thing that you need to look at pretty carefully in the end to determine level of interest in that. The interpretation will be discussed by Ernst in a presentation later this afternoon. That's the total count uh, gamma. And uh, this is passive total count gamma. This is not gamma gamma for density. And uh, it's just showing the various rock property types and uh, just another piece of information for helping with differentiation of rock types. Borehole 279 um, had the highest density uh, encountered in the whole survey, and that's right there, the roughly 3.1 uh, grams per centimeter cubed. And uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's the hole that's on the up dip side, uh, on the south side of the deposit. And uh, this um, section of the anomaly, uh, this is the density anomaly, there's the, the cross over there. Uh, has been uh, in interpreted uh, and it all depends on what shape of uh, what shape of target you assign to it. Uh, we have variable um, tonnages between uh, 300 million tons to 700 uh, uh, um, 300,000 tons to 700 <laughs> to 700,000 tons uh, on that. This is um, what the geological survey has been working on, Ernst in particular has been doing this, and that's the correlation of the density to the lithology. And as, as you notice that the highest density is not coincident with the mineralization in the hole, but that whole section is, is a high density anomalous which cannot be attributed to uh, to mafic rocks or anything like that, so we believe that that is indicative of um, mineralization, off whole mineralization. So that, um, that brings us uh, to um, uh, look at what we achieved uh, with, with borehole gravity and where we're going with borehole gravity, and that's in terms of, uh, you know, getting to put the sensor where the targets are and closer to the targets so that we could get an evaluation of them, a quantitative evaluation of tonnage, which is um, uh, early in the exploration cycle that is very important. Uh, we're measuring the vertical component of gravity, so for triangulation we would need to survey multiple holes and do an inversion. Um, there are scenarios where the, the rock is not as competent as it is uh, around Lalor or uh, uh, Sudbury and things, places like that. And we have conducted surveys through um, steel casing. Work has been done to determine that the effect of the casing is, uh, is negligible. So it's totally valid to do, in fact that um, uh, survey for uh, Labrador iron mines was done through casing. The uh, benefits again are to provide tonnage uh, estimates early in the exploration cycle to determine the priority of that target. And uh, you know it's to help classify EM anomalies. An EM anomaly with tonnage is worth more than an EM anomaly without tonnage. And depending on where you are in your exploration cycle, uh, getting towards development, uh, grade control, uh, if it's density related, is uh, as an important uh, piece of information. So, thank you very much to the BC uh, Ge Geophysical Society, Natural Resources Canada, for uh, allowing me to use this data and show it, and Hud Bay Minerals for making that uh, 
the, the, the logistics possible and, and everything happened uh, while we were on site, and to Valet and Labrador Iron Mines for providing their data for show and tell here. Questions? Uh, just before we start the questions, uh, I, I want to tell everybody that we're going to have another presentation of a BCGS um, scholarship to a student, a deserving student. And I hope everybody hangs around for that to witness it. We have to support our next generation. And uh, so we'll throw it open to questions. Not from a single hole. We, we need to survey multiple holes, and there is a 3D inversion which uh, places um, uh, the mass into a specific location. So um, I, I actually have um, an example of that, uh, but it wasn't related to Lalor, so I didn't include it here. Could you go back a couple slides? I want to ask you a question. How far back? Right there. Whoop. Oh, they had one. Is that that says conventional density in the top, the red. So that's a gamma gamma. Is it? No, the red is um, which one are you looking at? I, I'm looking at um, Oh okay. Four. Yep, yep, yep. You're you're looking at um, what uh, Dennis is looking at is a red profile and a and a green profile there. Is that what you're looking at? Yeah, exactly. Um, two densities calculated. Uh, one was uh, by doing a differential uh, between readings, as I described, and the other was uh, through an inversion process. Yeah, inversion uh, density and uh, conventional density through separate readings, and uh, that was showing the, com the difference between the two. Actually, Ernst does have some gamma gamma densities, and he's going to probably show that, so. Hang in there. This is going to be an exciting afternoon. <laughs> what were the cost of the survey? The cost of uh, gravity surveys is running uh, around 10% of uh, drilling cost. Uh, so it, it varies, obviously, with uh, uh, the depth of holes and, and so forth. But uh, uh, that's more or less a rule of thumb. Um, one of the things about the borehole gravity is uh, it travels at 250 meters per hour, so uh, deep holes obviously uh, tend to be a little bit pricier because you're, it takes you time to get down to the bottom of the hole. Uh, Adam, can you come up? Any other questions? Thanks, Roman. <laughs> 